So today we're going to be mainly talking about visualization. And I had mentioned before that PCA can be used for visualization by setting k to be 2 or maybe 3 or 1, but especially 2. And then the z values for each training example are two coordinates. And we can actually look at those coordinates and try to visualize our data set. So PCA is a parametric model, W being the parameters that uh, represent the transformation from x to z. And it's also a linear model, which means, as we saw, it's basically just projecting down to this lower dimensional space. And today we're going to talk about non-parametric, non-linear uh, approaches to this dimensionality reduction problem. And again, dimensionality reduction refers to starting in some higher dimension d and reducing to some lower dimension k. So here's what MDS is. It says, let's forget about W, and let's just directly optimize the scatter plot. So we don't have any W at all. We just have our Z matrix. It's N by K as it was before. And let's just come up with some loss function that is going to tell us how good our scatter plot is. And then let's just optimize that. So what we really need to talk about today, the main thing we need to talk about is what would be a good loss function. How do we say that a particular scatter plot is good or not good at visualizing something? And the cost functions usually look something like this, where, well, let me just fully expand the slide. OK, this is definitely the first place where you can fall off on this lecture, because there's a lot going on in that equation. So there's uh, three minus signs there. And we need to talk about all of them. So let's start from the inside out. This thing over here, xi minus xj, we're summing over all pairs of points. So our loss function, the, the form of our loss function is going to be over all pairs. That's why we have the double sum. We're going to say xi minus xj, that's, and we'll use some sort of distance. I haven't specified the norm here yet, but um, some sort of distance between those two points. For example, Euclidean distance. That's how far away the two points are in the original space. So that's a d subtracting a vector of length d by another vector of length d and taking some sort of norm of it. And then the other thing over here is that same with z. For that same pair of points in the new space, how far apart are they? So maybe I'm projecting onto the plane. I have two points. They're this far away. I project them down. Now they're this far away. The third minus sign in the middle is the difference between those two distances. So here's how far apart these two points used to be. Here's how far apart these two points are now. How different are those two numbers? And then squared, which is just how we usually deal with things when we're trying to make them close to each other. We subtract them and square them. That's what we've been doing all term. So any questions about interpreting this? Because this is really critical for the rest of the lecture. Do you have to use the same norm in both? Uh, no, you don't have to use the same norm, and we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. I guess one question would be why, who cares about distances? Um, and the point is, I mean, of course we can decide what a beautiful plot looks like. We can say, I like plots that look like a smiley face. And my objective function can be, does this thing look like a smiley face? But if it has nothing to do with the data set, it's useless, right? So we, we're trying to measure, did we preserve some properties of the original data set? And we're going to squish everything into two dimensions uh, while doing that. But the, the point of this is to say, here's some property that we, if that property was completely broken, maybe we would no longer be representing uh, 
the structure of our original data set. OK, so if, say, d equals 3, you start in three dimensions. You have these four points. And then you want to map those points into two dimensions. Then question, the question is, is this a reasonable mapping? And you can say, well, one way of deciding that is you can look at this distance over here in the original space. It's small. This distance over here in the new space, it's small, and so on and so forth. So even though we've used Z to mean our transformed features in the past, and we used W to mean the things we're optimizing, Today, the Z values are the things we're optimizing, but it still makes sense to call them Z to be in line with PCA. And they are just transformed features, but we're optimizing them or learning them. OK, I think I talked about that. So PCA projects, we've talked about that. And I mentioned you can think of PCA as rotating and then projecting, or projecting and then rotating, or, or whatever. Um, but the point is, if you started with this data set, and the, X, the X's and O's are just so you can keep track of which point is which. They're not actually part of the data set. Then if I ran PCA on this, I might learn this blue line. And it's going to stick the O point just somewhere in the middle of there, which is in a way kind of violating the original structure when we're going from two dimensions down to one, because that point was an outlier. That O point was an outlier in the original data set, but in the transformed data set, it doesn't look like an outlier at all. It's just somewhere in the middle of the pack. So that's trying to illustrate why PCA might not do this. Whereas if we ran MDS on this data set, then Maybe we would get some output like this, because it's preserving these distances. That point was an outlier, so it's going to be put far away. <coughs> OK, so here's another just made up data set where, again, the shapes are just so you can visually keep track of where each point ended up getting mapped to. So we could do PCA on this data set, and it will just collapse a whole big <coughs> mess of things. Um, but really, there's some kind of structure here. And the, it kind of looks like um, all the X points are somehow together and all the O points are somehow together. And with PCA, we just smush everything and lose that information. And again, what we're kind of hoping for, and this may or may not happen, is somehow preserving the structure of the original data set. OK, so we are definitely outside of the land of SVD here. We're not doing PCA, right? We're doing something else. But we can use our optimization methods that we know, like gradient descent, to solve this problem. Um, and it, it, is, it, it does have local minima that are not optimal, so the result is going to be sensitive to initialization, but we can get something out of this with gradient descent. OK, so Instead of writing these things as norms, we could write the whole thing like this, and that 
the, this gets back to Fed's question from earlier. So we can use any kind of distance functions we want, or you know, we can play around with this. Um, and we'll talk about how different choices of distance, even within this general framework, can get us a whole bunch of different methods. So this is sort of a, a family of methods. I forgot your name. Oh, Rob. Rob. What would be the benefit of using a different distance function in a high dimensional versus low dimensional space? What would be the benefit of using a different distance function in a high dimensional versus low dimensional space? Um, we will get to that. Yeah, let's, let's leave that for a little bit. Um, but we are, we have to be a little bit careful in the sense that we're also trying to make those two numbers similar to each other. So if they're completely different, then something's a bit worrying. OK, so I'm not going to go into this, but I'm just going to state that PCA is a special case of this for a particular choice of similarities or dissimilarities. Um, I was looking into it this morning. It's not like a one-line proof, but I think it's fine to just say um, that it's the case. So we can use all different kinds of norms um, and, and get different behaviors. And I'll show you some pictures in a minute. OK, so on your assignment uh, five, and, and by the way, after today's lecture, we'll have covered everything up to the end of assignment five. Um, so if you've already started playing around with that, you have a data set of animals and a bunch of different features for the different animals. And you're trying to make a scatter plot to visualize um, the different animals. and maybe see which ones are similar to which other ones, and so on. So a, a lot of the approaches that you'll try on that, like PCA, end up bunching a whole bunch of things together. And the same kind of thing happens for MDS. So we have this, just like from a month ago or however long we talked about least squares linear regression was not robust to outliers because you were squaring something and it ended up focusing on these big things and the outlier would pull the whole fit. We kind of have a similar situation here that we have a bunch of large distances and a bunch of small distances and I'm just analyzing myself for getting these distances wrong. So I'm going to focus a lot on the large distances but that might not actually make sense given what I'm trying to do. Because intuitively, what you might care is that if two things are close together, they stay close together. And you might not actually care that much that if two things are way far apart from each other, they're actually that same way far apart in the lower dimensional space. So that's kind of the, the problem with what I've said so far. And we're going to try to fix that uh, in several ways. So one way to deal with this is called Salmon's mapping. And it's just a normalization of the distances. And the idea is that if we, instead of minimizing only that top term, if we divide by this bigger distance, then we basically remove that overall scaling factor that bigger distances and smaller distances are all sort of on the same playing field. So I can show you some pictures. Um, this is from a paper visualizing metagenomes. I don't actually know what metagenomes are, but I'm sure someone in this room does. Um, but here with PCA, we can see this effect that we're basically clumping a bunch of stuff into the same region of the space. And then we have a few other points. And we don't really get 
a satisfying visualization. By the way, I should add, for a lot of the pictures I'm going to show you today or that you might encounter, um, there's often these colors and people like to say, oh, I tried this dimensionality reduction algorithm and look how good it is. It kind of separates out the colors nicely. But just keep in mind, this is all unsupervised learning. So those colors are not available or not fed into the algorithm when it's actually doing this. Same with PCA or any of these non-parametric things. Um, and then we might look at them after the fact and say, oh, this thing did such a good job. I just gave it the features and it made this nice scatter plot. And then when I stick the colors back on because I already had some label information, it kind of looked reasonable. Um, but I just wanted to point out those are not actually being fed into the algorithm. OK, so when we add the salmon mapping, then when we reduce uh, our focusing on large distances, then we get something maybe a bit more spread out and more meaningful. Okay. So another example, and I showed you something like this earlier as well, is what if you have a data set that looks sort of like this? So this is this kind of spiral roll shape. And again, the colors here are not part of the computation, but just so we can keep track of what went where. So. It looks here like our data set is just living on a two-dimensional manifold. And the, world, the word manifold essentially means some curvy subspace living inside of our space. So that's the definition that will be useful to us. So a lot of unsupervised learning, or a lot of machine learning in general, is trying to understand the, the structure of our data set. And it's sort of this poorly defined word, but what seems to be going on here is there's just two axes along which you're varying, right? You can go across this spiral or you can go around the spiral. So if we were to transform this from three dimensions into two, we kind of want to unroll um, the spiral into this thing on the right. But that This seems like a tough test case that would pose a good challenge to some of these dimensionality reduction algorithms. Fred? So can you roll back to its original dimension? Can you revert back to it? Uh, no. So the question is, can you revert back to the original dimension? So none of these things we're talking about are reversible or invertible. So PCA, all the variants of PCA we talked about, NMF, MDS, all these things, they're all not invertible transformations because we're, we're losing information. We're going from d numbers per variable to k less than d numbers per variable. And the whole, with PCA, the whole loss function was if I try to invert it, that's what x hat was, it's the reconstruction. Let's say I'll multiply z times w, which is I'll do my best to undo it. How close do I get to the original? But even though we're preserving the information, well, even though we're preserving the information, we're trying to preserve the information. But in ge that's, that's the loss. So one way you could think about the loss is how much information can we preserve. But at the end of the day, you're kind of squeezing this through a bottleneck of it has to live in fewer dimensions. And so in general, it shouldn't be possible to preserve all the information. I, I just maybe I'll just add to that that in a way that's that's a, a feature and not just a bug in the sense that when we use PCA uh, we're trying to distill the good stuff right and so the fact that and maybe ignore the less important stuff so the fact that we can't go back 
maybe that's a good thing because we've kind of gotten ourselves the good parts. OK, so if you take standard PCA or multidimensional scaling MDS and you run it on this spirally thing, you basically end up with a kind of squashing of the roll. So this is again going from d equals 3 to k equals 2. And so what I want to talk about now is a new type of distance that should somehow capture what's going on here called the geodesic distance. And it's basically the distance along the thing, right? But that's hard to calculate because we don't have the thing. That's, we're, we're trying to find it at the same time, right? But what we kind of like to, to know is how far is that point away from, from that point? Well, instead of Euclidean distance, how far is it if we were traveling along the manifold and yet we don't know the manifold? And so the general high level of strategy is going to be, well, I can kind of hop around to nearby points. And if I'm just doing a bunch of this hopping, how long does it take me to get there? Um, and then we can maybe estimate these distances. And so we're, we don't actually need to invent a whole new algorithm to deal with this roll type of data. We can just think of it as we're still doing MDS, but going trying very hard to come up with a very interesting distance and then still just optimize that same loss as before and get something interesting out of it. So I like this a lot. Um, e each of these are images of the letter A. And each square is one training example. So imagine this was the data set you were given. When you look at this, you immediately see, well, maybe I can ask you, what, what do you think is really the number of dimensions that these images live in? Or how do they vary how, from each other? Two. Two. Why? Or what are they? One is rotation, other is a resize. Right, yeah. One is rotation, one is size. So when we look at those things, we're like, this is kind of a two-dimensional universe here. I, I, can, I have the, the rotation, the angle, basically, and then I have the size, right? But if those are 100 by 100 images, then when they're just fed into the computer, they're 10,000 dimensional um, entities, and they just look like a giant mess, right? But if we could automatically, using unsupervised learning, understand that those are only the only two dimensions, um, how about this? Let's say I was trying to predict how fast or how easily someone could read the letter. OK, that was my supervised learning problem. I could just feed in all the pixels of the image. But that is a very, very complicated mapping from the pixels of the image to this output variable I'm looking for, which is how readable is this thing. But we all know that, well, actually, if I could get out of each image those two features, the size feature and the angle feature, just using those two features and linear regression with just learning two parameters, we could probably do a great job of predicting that thing. Because the more upright it is, the easier it is to read. And maybe the bigger it is, the easier it is to read. And that's it, right? So the whole interesting part of that supervised learning problem is really getting these images into those two features. And then the supervised learning part is actually very straightforward. So yeah, definitely things you do involving those raw pixels, like taking Euclidean distances between pairs of images, or feeding the pixel values into a linear regression, are really missing what's going on here. Uh, and that's sort of the power of unsupervised learning if, if it works, I guess. Um, and later in the course, we'll, the last part of the course, we're going to talk about neural networks, where we also try to automatically learn good features, but in a different way. So 
the particular algorithm we're going to talk about is called isomap, and it's also part of your assignment five, so you'll be implementing part of this. And the way it works is that, as I mentioned before, it's, it's essentially a distance function, and it's a, this idea of, of, of hopping around the manifold. So for each point, you look for the neighbors. And then you think of this as a weighted graph, where the weight is the distance between points. So the, the neighbors part is just kind of pruning the graph. And say so you only get to have an edge if you're pretty close, um, close enough to be a neighbor. And then we approximate the distance, or we define the geodesic distance, to be the shortest path from one point to another inside of this graph. And then we just run MDS using these distances. I guess when I was asked which parts of Computer Science 221 are actually needed for this course, I forgot about this moment of needing to know about graphs. But um, I guess I'm assuming most of you have, have, I guess in 221 you covered Dijkstra's algorithm? You? Or shortest paths? Yeah? OK, right. So as a bit of an aside, this issue of finding neighbors or graphs between neighbors, uh, there's many ways you can obtain these types of things. So graphs are actually very useful in data science, machine learning, data mining, because they appear all over the place. Like your group of Facebook friends, that's essentially a graph. or YouTube videos or all these different kinds of things. Um, but what we're dealing with here is we're not explicitly starting with a graph, but we're converting our features into a graph. Um, and there's a bunch of ways to do this. You can just say if points are sufficiently close to each other, then they're considered neighbors. That's what we did with DB scan. Um, or you can just say, I'm picking some number k. That's the number of neighbors I'm allowing each point to have. And then there's this issue that being k and n's is not a reciprocal thing. So if um, you are one of the three points closest to me, that doesn't mean I'm one of the three points closest to you. In fact, if I stand here, that's actually true, right? Maybe you three are the closest to me, but I'm fifth closest to you, or something like that. Uh, so there's some details here about how you actually define a neighbor, whether it's you have to both be neighbors of each other or one or the other. But we're not going to worry about that super much. OK. So well, these are just a bunch of pictures showing the different ways you can compute to make this neighbor graph from a bunch of points. OK, so isomap the whole algorithm. For each point, we want to find the neighbors. And then we want to find weights between the edges. And then we construct this weighted graph. And then we compute the shortest path between pairs of points. That becomes our distance. And then we run MDS. So it really seems like a whole lot of effort because we're just you got to deal with this whole can of worms of graphs and neighbors and shortest paths and stuff that we didn't think we would have to deal with. Um, but the good news is this actually works. So, um, and it kind of makes sense that it works. And there's a bunch of hyperparameters, right? There's how many neighbors and which type of neighbor thing, and you'll fiddle around with those in the assignment and see the effects. But Intuitively, it should kind of work, because as long as we're computing neighbors in a sort of sane way, 
And as long as this manifold is densely populated so that there's a way to get all the way around, then we can actually start to un uncurl, I guess, um, this type of data set. And just to reiterate why you would actually care about this, um, I think thinking of those, the letter A is a nice example of um, why it would be so useful to actually get those true features for each example. Okay, yeah, so this works assuming we can get a reasonable graph. So I really like this um, isomap example from images of hand and wrist movement. So again, each image is an example in your training set. Um, you just throw this in, and again, there are these two real dimensions from a human point of view, which is the, the rotation and the hand opening and closing. And to be able to extract this in an unsupervised way is pretty impressive and, and really nice. So have we, I don't remember, have we dealt with the handwritten digits? Maybe not in an assignment, but in lecture I think we have. Um, so this is very famous data set in machine learning, these MNIST digits, handwritten digits from 0 to 10. Again, going from images to these labels, it's usually a supervised learning problem where you're taking the image and trying to predict which digit it is. But we can consider just taking those images of digits and running these visualization techniques on them. And this is what PCA gets you. And again, the colors are added after the fact just so we can see what it's doing. The PCA is just a big mess, basically. Um, the salmon mapping was this modified MDS. It looks kind of nice. It's learning some dimensions. I don't know what they are, but it's learning to separate the different digits. Isomap does something else, which kind of looks nice and reasonable. Um, and the, the last method we're going to talk about today is called T-SNE. It has kind of a funny name. Um, but it produces this, what I would say, really nice and impressive uh, visualization of the digits data set. Because it's, it's pretty much, it's, it's almost solving the supervised learning problem for you. I mean, from here, well, it's hard to, yeah, when we're looking at the colors, I, I can remove the colors. But um, it's really separating out all these different things just from pixel intensities in, in these different images. So here's the same thing without the colors. Yeah, so I think it's actually useful to get in the mindset, I mean useful for the next couple of weeks of the course, to get in the mindset of the unsupervised learning here is doing the kind of heavy lifting of, it, of extracting the useful features or useful dimensions. And then if someone does that really well for you, then you can imagine just using k nearest neighbors on this or decision tree or something. You could probably get really good accuracy if someone gave you access to those features, whereas if you're just using the pixel intensities, you might not do as well. Well, it depends. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, so what's nice about this is you can also look at where the actual digits are. So maybe a, a 9 often looks like a 4. And it's nice to see that even when you're down to two dimensions, the 9 and the 4 cluster are kind of near each other. 
So um, T SNE stands for T Distributed Stochastic Neighbor Embedding. It's a relatively recent, I don't remember what year, but probably last 10 years or less um, method. And essentially, it allows this. Uh, so I'm not going to go into all the details for this method, but essentially, it allows variations in these large distances. So it's doing what I mentioned with that salmon mapping was trying to do, but doing a very good job of it. And focusing on these small distances or neighbor distances. Again, just to get back to this, what's going on here with PCA? Well, PCA is sticking these X's and O's right on top of each other. And it's, it's, not, it's not upset about that. Well, PCA is minimizing a completely different objective. But even regular MDS, the fact that two things are really close to each other when maybe they shouldn't be is sort of getting drowned out by, oh, these things should be really far away from each other, um, which t -SNE takes care of. So there's a bunch in the, in the bonus slides about how this actually works if you're interested. But um, essentially, I just want you to be aware that this exists, and this is an active area of research. And these things are really nice and useful for practitioners who are doing unsupervised learning. And going back to the very beginning of the course when I said, well, maybe you just want to look at your data set. Here are some new <coughs> tools in your toolbox for visualizing high dimensional data. OK, so this pretty much concludes the end of part four of the course, which was, I guess I'd call it the PCA section, but unsupervised learning with linear models. We had this term latent factor model, which basically means there are these latent or unobserved dimensions or features, and we're trying to figure them out automatically. And basically, we were doing a lot of this, minimizing uh, this function or this function or however you wanted to write it. So there's a whole bunch of applications of PCA and of this family of algorithms. And it's going to be a building block for what we're going to do in the rest of the course as well. So outlier detection, that's one thing you're going to do on assignment five, where you're going to use robust PCA and look at the reconstructions. And the reconstructions should be robust to outliers, so try to not reconstruct outliers. And then you're going to look at the difference between the reconstruction and the original <coughs> on these uh, video frames of a highway to try to do um, foreground background separation. So. You, you, you'll use PCA on the assignment to basically find unusual um, activity in a video footage, which seems like has nothing to do with PCA. So there's quite a lot of applications. Um, data compression, we didn't talk about that too much, but you can think of the Z matrix as a compressed version of the X matrix, because instead of having D numbers for each training example, you just have K numbers. We talked a lot about visualization today. Um, filling in missing entries, we'll talk about that on Wednesday. So with PCA, the classic form of PCA, we have these orthogonal factors or basis vectors. And we use SVD to get them. And it also returns them in this ordered way that we can interpret the first 
principal component as the one explaining the most variance and so on and so on, even though Oliver noticed a mistake in the slide last time that made it seem otherwise. So then we talked about NMF, non-negative matrix factorization. And we had this idea from earlier in the course that L1 regularization gives sparsity. And now we have this non-negativity constraints also giving us sparsity. And we're not doing this to get better reconstructions, meaning we're not doing this to get a better score on the loss. We're actually getting a worse score on the loss, but we're doing that for the interpretation of what we're getting out. Okay. So then today we did MDS, so we said, okay, that was interesting, but what if we want nonlinear transformations? And there's these mentions of kernel PCA, which we didn't really get into, but that's something you can do. We can also do this just directly optimizing the Z, which is what we did today. So then we had this kind of big problem today, which was this large distance, small distance issue that said, well, I really care about the large distances. I just need this thing to be far away from everything else. So I don't care if I smush everything else into right here, as long as that thing is far away from them. But then the smushing everything else doesn't really work for us as users of the algorithm. So we talked about a bunch of fancier versions of this. So that was sort of the high level summary of the last few classes. Um, today in particular, the more detailed summary we talked about MDS and how these different algorithms were uh, different distance functions in that same loss. And we introduced this idea of a manifold, which is we're looking for this low dimensional place where the data actually lives. And if we could understand what that was, it would be useful for interpretation, but also potentially useful for getting features for supervised learning. And uh, talked about isomap, you'll implement it. And I briefly talked about TSNE. So this doesn't happen very often, but I guess we're done a few minutes early. So enjoy, and I'll see you on Wednesday.